Hello and welcome, royal family. I'm going to actually start today's lesson off uh, reading a portion of an email from a lady who uh, really humbles me. Extremely intelligent, uh, very generous, uh, with supporting this ministry in a lot of different ways financially and, and uplifting me. Um, she is from Australia. I just say her first name. I don't put last names out there unless I feel it's okay. Julie. Um, I just want to read a portion of an email she sent me, and it really pertains to the time we live in. And, and um, it's these type of people that lift me up. I honestly, uh, I know it's God ultimately using people, but um, you know, when somebody just comes through for you, either it's uh, support something they say or do in a moment in time when you need it. Uh, maybe it's a financial issue that pops up, and all of a sudden somebody gives a gift, and you're like, oh my gosh, it's very humbling. Uh, she's one of these type of people, and I know I'm not the only ministry she supports, and it's very humbling to have people like that that are out there supporting ministries that are just trying to do their best to teach the truth. So I want to read a portion of Julie's email to me, um, and it really pertains to the time that we live in. I think people need to take it to heart. Here it is. This is just a portion. She's eloquent, eloquent writer. She probably needs to be writing novels, I believe. I tell her that all the time. So let me read this portion of it because it stuck with me. We do not give up. Fear not. For the Lord thy God is with us. This world is not our home. That's difficult for most diehard Christians to wrap their head around. As people in pursuit of perfect environment and work, rest, and play, it's a sneaky dilemma that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Enticing folk to hold on to this world with a tight grip, whereas an open hand in righteousness draws us nearer to God with exceptional capacity to live. When we know our rightful position in Christ Jesus, we can be obedient, get serious, and grow up. It's easier to stick your fingers in your ear and say, la, 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 I love that, like a two-year-old and dismiss the obvious. That's fear manifest when one does not seek to understand and then later perceive during the turmoil that time's been wasted. Not pertaining to the word as sustaining life for eternity, rather minimizing the urgency of today, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It is better to have a few who are strong who gather, a few who become stronger, and those few gather a few more than to be surrounded by bums and seats, man-pleasers having a form of godliness yet denying the power therefore. We are the church. Wherever we are, the church is. Amen. God shall supply all you need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Our stability is endure is to endure as a good as our significant contribution to the word in our life. How we stand alone and how we stand together as one is relevant. The word of God has always been alive and powerful for those who choose to continue in it without wavering. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that built it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh, but in vain. The true condition of the church is exposed during a pandemic chaos, and uncertainty. As distressing as the unrest and violence at our doorstep, the Jezebel spirit infiltrating the church, where peak momentum should resolve is quickly become dissolved when returning to familiarity, waiting around passively for normalcy to return. As the Lord holds the world in his palm, ignorance infests community. Promptly, rapidly, instantly, immediately is how close we are to the rapture. Let me say that again. Promptly, rapidly, instantly, immediately is how close we are to the rapture. With faith in him who called us, we trust to chew the meat and spit out the bones, to discern between human reasoning and the Holy Spirit guiding principle, to take what is relevant and essential for his glory. Julie, I want to say thank you. I think that lifted some people up. I know it lifted me up, and I appreciate all your support all the time. It's very humbling for me and my wife um, to receive support in all kinds of realms from different people out there and realize that the channel is not in vain. It is a little ministry. It is growing. It is touching life. So today, in the year of our Lord, what is it, June 25th, 2020, we're coming to the end of June soon, folks. When God decides the storm is over, it is final. It is complete. When God decides, this message is going to touch on Jesus Christ being God and how he displayed that in the scene on the boat when Peter stepped off during that storm. So we are back in Matthew chapter 14. You guys can pick it up there. This is lesson 187 in the Matthew series. 
And uh, I have a couple announcements before we pray. First and foremost, I have a new PayPal button on my webpage, brbministry.org, on the bottom of the page. That's a two-page generic website. I know there are people on there trying to look for memberships. It's really not a membership site. It is just a site to get information on me and have links to different platforms where I put my videos and teaching out there. But there's plenty of information on those two pages. There is now a PayPal button. Okay, so there's a PayPal button on the bottom of that prbministry.org page. you got to look for it. I still will maintain my GoFundMe account for a few months, maybe to the end of the summer, into the winter, until I know I have other avenues to accept credit cards because that becomes a challenge sometimes. So I just want everyone to know it is there if the Spirit moves you to support this ministry. If it doesn't, that's okay. There's no guilt or shame here. This is a this is a grace-based ministry. I just rely on the Lord. If He decides to shut me down and I can't go on any further, that'll be what happens. But I know the Lord is leading me further and further, and I know people like Julie and many others out there. I have about 8 to 12 people that are pretty steady on this channel that support it pretty well, and it's really... Um, lifted me up and showed me that I could keep going forward in it and see where it leads. I want to turn it into a full-time uh, ministry, which it's looking like right now, but I'd like it to even go further than that so we will see where God the Holy Spirit leads it by the end of the year 2020. Now, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw His glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And like newborn babes, long for that pure milk of the Word so that by it you may grow in respect to your salvation. I would take a listen to that letter, portion of that letter email that I received from Julie uh, again because I think it's very pertinent for the day and age we live in. So we're getting ready to take in the word of God. It's time to grow up. First John 1 John 1.8 tells the believers, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. First John 1 John 1.9, believers, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, cleansing us from all unrighteousness. In verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. His word is not in us. Let's take a moment of silent prayer to wash away the sins and distractions in our life. Get serious with the word of God. Get our fellowship right and say a prayer for the division in this world. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. Father, we thank you for this time we have to come and study your word. And we're asking you to bless those people that touch this ministry and have lifted this ministry up in the last six or eight months. Father, we know... The handful of people out there that are very serious students that support this ministry in different ways, whether it's working on social media, lifting this up, or the emails and support, the verbal and written support, the financial, obviously, support, Father, all those things. Lift those people up. Bless them, Father. Move them forward in your plan. Let these lessons, be able to take these lessons out to a lost and dying world. Let them learn from these lessons, grow from these lessons. Therefore, they are going to affect the others in, his, in, in, in their periphery, Father. We know how that's how it works. That when we are positive, we are growing, we are moving forward, we start to affect one, two, three, and four people around us. Eventually that affects 10. 10 will chase 20. 20 will chase 100. Father, we know that's how it works. So I'm asking you to bless those that lift this ministry up, that are receiving the message from the Holy Spirit from this ministry, Father. And we're asking for your healing hand across this world right now, Father. There's too much division. We know... We know this is birth pangs, Father. If anybody can discern the Bible in the times we live in, we know this is birth pangs as to what is to come. There is, there is signs and symbols around us of what is to come, Father. We realize this is not, this is temporal, this is not forever. But let us be the positive pivot to move forward, Father. And if there is time that we can extend this world a little bit with being positive believers and gives us time to evangelize and lift up other people and get the truth out there. Father, show us what to do, how to be soldiers and ambassadors in your plan, Father. We're asking these things through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, we're going to jump right into it. So remember, prbministry.org, bottom of the page, there is a PayPal uh, credit card thing. I think it asks a couple of things like an email or a cell phone. I... That is a very secure website. I do not do anything with anybody's email. I can delete it from my site or whatever, uh, from my, my personal email. So any of that stuff that you send on, the, on that uh, website comes directly to me. So understand that. If you send an email on that website, it comes directly to my private email. If you use your credit card, it comes directly to me privately to, attached to a PRB ministry bank account. So it's all secure. Um, feel free to use it if you want. If not, you do what you want with it. Thank you very much. I appreciate the support. Matthew chapter 14, we are in, folks. When God decides a storm is over, it is final, exclamation point. Matthew 14, 27. 
But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Matthew 14, 28, Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Because Peter had the belief out of all the folks on the boat, we don't know if it was the original 12 or there was 18 or 20 people, but we know there were serious followers on that boat, and he's the only one. Verse 29, and he said, come. Jesus said, come. One word, and Peter got out of that boat and walked on water and came toward Jesus. Matthew 14, 30. But seeing the wind, the distractions, and the cosmic system, his faith got bumped, as I told you. He became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me, which is the right prayer at that moment in time, I would assume. Matthew 14, 31, immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? Peter would have been, um, if he could have just focused back on the Lord and got his mind right, he would have came back up out of the water and walked towards the Lord himself. But because he was so fearful and distracted and his faith was pushed to the side, Jesus had to rescue him. And isn't that the way it is sometimes? Matthew 14, 32, I think a lot of people could say amen to that. When they got onto the boat, the wind stopped immediately. Now Matthew 14, 33, and those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, You are certainly God's son. Proskuneo is the word you're looking at there for worship. This is a Greek verb that tells us this is true worship. It really speaks to being uh, uh, bowing down in worship. It, it speaks to it's an action. So it's a verb, it's an action word, it's a Greek verb. This is often used to describe a bowing down and kissing of the hand in a royal sense, they realizing you're in front of somebody of royalty that's special, or even used, and this is interesting, used for a term when a dog recognizes its master and licks the hand of its master. And in fact, my dog is down here laying down in the corner over there. It's nice and cool down here. Uh, so hopefully he doesn't bark. But he won't come over and lick my hand right now, but that's what he would do normally is come over here and lick my hand and bow his head. That's what this speaks to. If they had not recognized the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as deity before, at that moment in time they did. Now, there may have been 12, the apostles, or 20, we don't know. 20 people on the boat, we simply don't know. We know for sure the original 12 apostles were there, and we can only guess there was one. One who did not come to fully rely upon the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We know his name, Judas Iscariot. Satan would never have been able to enter into the soul of Judas if he was a true believer, he was a believer on the surface, verbally, as I've told you before. Many people say, yeah, I'm a Christian, and check the box, but they truly do not believe. Now, Satan could not, he would not have been able to enter that soul of Judas Iscariot if he was a, even a weak believer. Satan can only influence him if he was a believer, but the fact that he was not a believer, and he was the only one on that boat who didn't really come to believe, so at that point, we know Satan could enter the soul. From that moment, Jesus Christ came to them. It was a sign God was, God was with them. If they didn't see it before, today was a sign. It had been that way from day one, obviously, but much more so in this moment in time during this storm, walking across the water and dealing with Peter in this manner was miraculous. Matthew 14, 27, but immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, what? Take courage. It is I. Very powerful statement. Do not be afraid. Exodus 3.14 tells us what God said to Moses, I am who I am. We're going to look at this today because Jesus Christ is God. If you've ever doubted that or somebody's made you try to believe that Jesus was just a prophet or a special man chosen by God, that is a lie. Exodus 3.14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. In John 8.58, what does it say? Jesus said to them, truly, truly, verily, verily. Harmain, Harmain is the word. Pay attention, pay attention in the original language. I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. So when Jesus says it is I and he's coming to you, that's God telling you, I'm coming to you. I've got you. Don't worry. I'm in control. I make the storms. I created them. Jesus Christ is the great I am. There never was a time that the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ wasn't God. There was a time during his incarnation, we would say, which we call the doctrine of the hypostatic union, that he willingly, willingly chose not to apply his deity, but he never stopped being God. We're going to look at that today in this message. Hebrews 13 eight tells us what? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Nobody except for God can be the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm not the same uh, man I was at 21 or 19 years old, who I am today. Okay, physically, mentally, in a lot of realms. 
God is always the same yesterday, today, and forever. Malachi 3, 6, for I, the Lord, do not change. Amen? Therefore, you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. Now, Peter, who already believed, was able to walk on water for a moment. We looked at that. Pretty amazing. Because he had belief. He had some faith. Peter did so because God told him to do so. The word of God told him to do so. And God's words are all powerful, folks. A simple command from the mouth of God and nature stands still. Miracles happen. A simple word from the mouth of God. God told Moses, what? In the Old Testament, stretch out that staff and that problem of the Red Sea that you see in front of you, that'll be solved. Matthew 14, 29, and, God, and Jesus said what? He said, come, one word. And Peter got out of that boat, walked on water, and came towards Jesus. Simply one word. And if he didn't want to say a word, just think it for a moment in time, it would have happened as well. Exodus 14, 21 lines up with this. Then Moses, being told to use that staff by the Lord. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord swept the sea back by a strong east wind all night, turned the sea into dry land so the waters were divided. When God says it, it happens. God says stop, everything stops. The rotation of the world, the stars stop, everything stops. When God says that one word, stop, that's the all-powerful God. That's who Jesus Christ is. The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ need only reach out a hand, and a grown man, Peter could have been 160, 180, 200 pounds. We don't know. But the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ need only reach out a hand, a symbol of help. And a grown man is lifted up back into the boat during a severe windstorm. Who can do that? Matthew 14, 32. When they got into the boat, what happened? The wind stopped. Not a word was spoken. No call for assistance. Jesus didn't look up and say, Father, make it stop. The storm stops abruptly when Christ steps into the boat because in his mind he decided that's enough stop and it stops when god has allowed a situation listen to me now carefully no matter what it is because we got a lot going on in our streets today here in america and i think across the world but when god allows a situation good bad or ugly whether it be a satanic attack or a spiritual test to come to its completion which was decided in eternity past it always was it is final when he says that's it it's done the test is done the, the satanic attack is done. Whether we look at Job or things that Paul and Peter went through, no matter who it is, Joseph in prison, when God said in eternity past, it's going to end on this day at this time at that second on the clock, it happens. God need only not play any games, folks. We play games. God plays no, no games or uses trickery. He, 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 when he ordains something from eternity past, if he said it's going to happen on this date at that time, it happens at that exact time. Second, God need not play any games or use trickery, folks. The issue in today's lesson, which we just will go over briefly for today, is the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was making it clear that he is God. If they had any doubters at this point, he's letting them know, fellas, I've been explaining to you and doing things and teaching you I am God. If any doubt had popped up during the past few years with his healings, miracles, and teachings, I mean, he just took a couple loaves of bread and a couple pieces of fish and fed like 10,000 people. Was that not, not enough? This certainly would be enough. Today, the closest followers of Christ on that boat had no more excuses not to believe in him. And we need to be the same. No more excuses. Get off the fence. Don't say, yeah, I'm a Christian and check the box when you haven't come to fully cling to, rely upon, and realize who Jesus Christ is. There is no another name under the heavens except for Christ to be saved. That's your altar call. You want to go in heaven? You want to be into eternity? You want to have perfection? That's what everybody out in the street is fighting for? You want it? It only happens through Jesus Christ. One name under the heavens, folks. Only God can control the wind or a storm. Only God can stop a storm dead in its tracks. And only God can use a word to levitate a grown man on open water. Think about that. In fact, only God can walk on water, as Jesus had done right in front of them. Turn to, uh, where am I going to go? 1 Peter chapter 1. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1. Today's a good lesson for those folks that um, have people in their periphery, or maybe you stumbled on this page and you don't really know, is Jesus God? Did he claim to be God? Absolutely, all over the place. It's in his teaching, it's in his words, it's in the apostles' words. We can know what many scholars call uh, Greek syllogism. A Greek syllogism of deity, the deity of Christ today we'll look at. A syllogism 
is a logical formula, we would say, consisting of two premises and a conclusion. A major and minor premise plus a conclusion derived from deductive reasoning. Let me say that again. We're looking at something called a Greek syllogism, or you can call it, I think it's just a regular syllogism. I believe it comes from the Greek. Um, but a syllogism of deity, the deity of Jesus Christ. It's a logical formula consisting of two premises and a conclusion, and a major and a minor premises plus a conclusion derived from deductive reasoning. In other words, okay, I'm using the computer, I'm putting this on the internet, therefore I know how to use the internet. You understand what I'm saying? I think you will. A simple definition, actually, you can look up for yourself probably in a dictionary or online is something like this. All dogs are animals. All animals have four legs. Therefore, all dogs have four legs. That's simple, but that's what this means. This is exactly what the definition means. It is a simple logic and deduction for lack of a deeper explanation, I guess. It follows closely to another thing, take it from the Latin term, uh, a fortiori. Some of you may have heard that. It's, it's very similar how it means it's deducting things, looking at things and saying, if I can do this, this can happen. If this, if this means that, then this means this. It follows that uh, principle of a fortiori of logic, which is a Latin term for concluding an argument or presenting logic with an example. If I can do 50 push-ups, a fortiori, it only makes sense I can do 10, right? That, ty that type of logic. Now, a syllogism is common sense logic, folks, really. Now, following this formula, what we're looking at, the Trinity is eternal. Christ is a member of the Trinity. Therefore, what? Christ is eternal. There it is, the mathematical logic of all of it. And that's what I'm talking about. That's what you're going to look at today. And hopefully... Um, I'm not going to be able to get into it so deep. This could probably be a two or three part uh, message. I don't want to get too sidetracked. I don't feel like the Spirit's leading me like that. But I want to touch on it a little bit today because I've recently given you information in the last, I think, four, three to four lessons about the, the validity that Christ was who he said he was and that he is a part of human history. I, I think I proved that a couple of lessons ago. So this will add to that if you take it with your notes. There are verses that speak to this. And we will cover a few today just as a solid reminder that what the disciples witnessed every day and more specifically on that boat in that storm was God in action. That's what it was and it always was. 1 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. Let's pick it up at 1 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to those who reside as aliens, scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bethany, who are chosen... 1 Peter 1, 2, according to what? The foreknowledge of God the Father, you're seeing the Trinity in this, by the sanctifying work of God the Holy Spirit, that you may obey God the Son, Jesus Christ, and be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in fullest measure. What is this speaking to? The Trinity. This is not literal blood in this either, sprinkling of blood, but the sacrifice. Always remember that when the blood of Christ is talked about. It's the sacrifice Jesus submitted himself to upon that cross. That's what is in view, the saving work of Jesus Christ, that sacrificial saving work. Notice, though, we have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all mentioned in this verse. We have an omniscience of God. There's the omniscience of God the Father mentioned by the word foreknowledge right there. You see it. The omnipotence, the all-powerful of God, the Holy Spirit, sanctifying the believer. And then there is obedience to who? The Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All three are seen in their power source, in their divine triune Godhead. We see the same statements written in Corinthians and Matthew as well. 2 Corinthians, what does Paul say? 13, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of God the Holy Spirit be with you all, Paul says. He understood the Trinity very well. Matthew 28, 19. Go, therefore, the words of Jesus Christ, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in what? In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. In other words, I am part of the Trinity. Jesus Christ taught the Trinity. I don't care what people tell you uh, that come from other belief systems, uh, that Jesus was just a prophet or a chosen one. He was the Son of God, but he was only a human being. He's 100% God and 100% man. Now, I can't wrap my finite mind around it. I can explain it through Scripture, but we'll understand it someday in heaven. But that's the words of Jesus Christ right there, speaking about the triune Godhead. So the solilo um, so, uh, soliloquism, we would say, is that Trinity is eternal, right? Christ is the member of the Trinity, therefore Christ is eternal. This is part of that logic. If the Trinity is eternal, and Jesus Christ is preaching and teaching about the Trinity, he is part of it, Christ is a member of it, then therefore Christ is eternal. In fact, 
Isaiah 48, 16 is also set up in the same system. Isaiah 48, 16, come near to me, God is speaking. Listen to this from the first, I have not spoken in secret. From the time it took place, I was there, I am, I've been there. And now the Lord God, the Father, has sent me, the Son, and His Spirit, God, the Holy Spirit, Trinity, triune Godhead there. There it is again in Isaiah 48. Now this leads us to a very important point concerning the deity of Jesus Christ. For example, Micah 5.2 says Jesus Christ is eternal God during the Incarnation. Micah 5.2 But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, Till little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will go for me to be ruler in Israel. Speaking of Christ in the hypostatic union, his goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. It's always been. He has always been. He always will be. This was fulfilled by our Lord in Matthew 2, 5 through 6, actually. In Matthew 2, 5, it says, They said to him, in Bethlehem of Judah, for this is what has been written by the prophets in verse 6, And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who will be shepherd my people, Israel. That's what it's pointing to. Jesus Christ in his incarnation, where we say the hypostatic union. Notice the phrase from Micah 5, though. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. He's always been. How could somebody 30-something years old say, well, I was around during Abraham and Moses' time, because I am God. So those that I say that, that are telling you, uh, there are teachings out there that say Jesus Christ was not deed, he was not God, he was just a chosen one by God, is a lie, folks. The same Hebrew word for eternity is used to support the eternal existence of God the Father in many passages, actually. Olam is the word you're looking at, Olam. You see it in Genesis 21, 33, Psalms 41, 13, Psalms 92, Psalms 103, 17, Isaiah 40, 28. Same word. Talking about Jesus Christ. Eternity. He's been around ever, since the beginning to the end. The Alpha, the Omega. Take a note on these. I'm going to put a few on the board so you can understand and see it clearly used in its context. Don't let people lie to you folks about who Jesus Christ is. Turn to John chapter 1, royal family. John chapter 1. Here are some examples from that Hebrew word for eternity on the board as you take a note on some of those scriptures. Genesis 21, 33. There it is. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree at Beersheba. And there he called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. Same word. Isaiah 40, 28. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God. The Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. Same word, olam. Same Hebrew word, folks. What this proves for the Father, it also proves for God the Son. What it proves for the Father and the Holy Spirit, it also proves for God the Son, Jesus Christ, who and what He is. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. We've gone over this a lot. I use it a lot because the Word is Jesus Christ in the Scripture. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. That's one of the reasons we make an emphasis on study of the Word. Verse 2, He was in the beginning with God. Pretty clear distinction that Jesus Christ is God. He is the Word. Truthfully, you have to manipulate Scripture and even then, turn a blind eye, do verbal gymnastics or mental gymnastics and turn a blind eye to the evidence that Jesus is God. It takes that kind of uh, manipulation and mental and verbal gymnastics to prove he's not God, folks. It is really foolishness when someone won't come to that realization. It is either ignorance, really blind, blind ignorance, willful ignorance, I would say, or it is evil. And most times it is evil, one or the other. John 1, 3, all things came into being through him, Jesus Christ. Apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Just a few verses down, it clarifies this again. Are you wondering if Scripture points out Christ as not only the Messiah, he is King of kings, Lord of lords, he is God. It's all over his teachings. Jesus said it himself, the apostles taught it, Scripture screams it. John 1, 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word is Jesus Christ. The Word was around in the beginning. Jump ahead to John chapter 8. If you want to go into John chapter 8, you're jumping around a little bit, but I want you to get these down. It's a good exercise for your mind and your hands. 
You're getting things through the eye gate, the ear gate, the way I was taught at Robert McLaughlin Bible Ministries. Get it through as many gates as you can. Repetition goes over and over again. That way you can stand strong when people attack who and what Jesus Christ is. And we're coming to a day and age, the year of our Lord, 2020, where they are heading in that direction. Trust me when I tell you it is coming. If you haven't read my book, I put down a template in there of exactly what's going to happen and how it's going to escalate as time goes on and it's happening. Nothing to do with me, God the Holy Spirit, folks. You better be aware who Jesus Christ is and all it was and always will be. We're going to go to John chapter 8. This is all very obvious, but every, every so often, folks, every so often when you come across a scripture and the Spirit is showing you scriptures like Matthew chapter 14, God the Holy Spirit says you must clarify and remind people this. It's just God the Holy Spirit speaking to your teacher, telling him you got to clarify and remind people. Give them some more ammunition, put in their gun belt so they can get out there as warriors and ambassadors for me. John 8, 56. Look at John 8, 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Jesus is speaking. Your father Abraham rejoiced. He's going back a long ways, thousands of years. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see me, legalistic Jews who don't want to believe who I am. And he saw it and he was glad, Jesus says. John 8, 57. The Jews therefore said to him, you're not even 50 years old because they do not believe. You're not even 50 years old. Have you seen Abraham? How arrogant are you, this carpenter's son? They don't know they're talking to God himself. John 8, 58, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, verily, verily, our main, our main, important, important, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Ego, I me. That's what he says. I am. How much more would Jesus need to say for people to accept he was stating, I am God, other than his teaching and his own words, and he, then even get into the, the teaching of the apostles afterwards. It's all there. It's in Scripture. It's from his own words. I am, in the Greek, is ego I me, and it cannot be correctly rendered as anything except I am. That's it. I am. Definitive statement. It means I have always existed, actually. I will always be. I have been. I've been around. I've always existed. There never was a time, nor will there ever be a time, that the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ isn't in control of history and fully intertwined with the triune Godhead, one and the same. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Jesus was not saying, listen to me carefully because some people teach this the wrong way, Jesus was not saying, before Abraham was, I have been. That's not what he's saying, before Abraham was, I have been, as is the way some define the scripture from false teaching, from the Jehovah Witnesses, some of their writings, I think it's their original writings or an offshoot of it, um, I could be wrong, the JWs talk about, before Abraham was, I have been, no. They twist one or two little words here and there, folks. In fact, they translate ego I me as I am and the other verses in the same chapter, but they change it in this one. So they translate that ego I me, I am, as it, the same in other verses in the same chapter of John, as well as other passages in the New Testament, yet this one time they decide to twist it or change it. How deceiving is that? You find most false teaching that is similar to Christianity has only minor adjustments and subtle twists in Scripture, which is what the serpent did in the garden with the woman. Little subtle, one word change, one little question put behind something, very subtle, minor little twist, which they, you see in that Scripture right there that they do, but yet they don't do it anywhere else where it says, I am. God clearly made the statement to the Jews under Moses. Exodus 3.13 then Moses said to God, Behold, I'm going to the sons of Israel. He said, God, help me out. I'm already unsure about how strong I am. I'm, I have a speech impediment. I don't know if I can be a leader. What shall I say to them, God? The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, What is his name? There's the big issue. What shall I say to them? Moses is trying to deal with a pretty big situation. He's dealing with God and going to the, pow the most powerhouse, powerful nation who's enslaved a bunch of people, Egypt. And he's got to deal with this. So he's asking God, what do you want me to say? Exactly who are you? How do I explain who you are, God? This is a reminder that God always is, always was. He is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. He will always be God. And therefore, logically, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is always God as well. And he's stating who he is right here. Exodus 3.14, he goes on to saying, God said to Moses clearly, I am who I am. 
And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, when you go to gather my people, you say to them, I am has sent me. I am has sent me to you. That's who has sent me. I am, the great I am. Our Lord used the same terminology that the Father used to describe himself in Exodus 3.14. In fact, in the Greek writings of the Septuagint, I don't know if you're familiar with that, it's the Greek old, written in the Old Testament, the, the, the Greek version of the Old Testament. In the Septuagint, it reads, Ego I me, same thing, I am. Same writing, I am. It is one and the same term, folks. In fact, the Jews understood his use, Jesus' use of that Ego I me word that he uses to be the same as when by the, used by the Father. And that's, that's why they got upset, as the evidence by the fact that they sought to kill him when he said it. They knew what he was saying. John 8, 59, what does it say in John 8, 59? Therefore, they picked up stones to throw at him, the legalistic Jews did, when he basically said, I am God, I am the great I am. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. It was not his time to go to the cross and be crucified. But look how upset they got. Why do you think they got upset? Because he said, I am, I am God. The same God that stood in front of Moses in Exodus 3, 14 is standing in front of you here at 30 years old or 31 years old or whatever. Or 32 years old, however old he was at the time. Jehovah is the traditional translation of those Hebrew consonants, J-H-W-H, -H, the special name for the one true God. You guys, a lot of you know this. The Jews said that this name was too sacred to be even pronounced, so they would, they would barely pronounce it. They replaced it by the variety of names such as Lord or, or the name itself in their original language. So they wouldn't even say it. They, Jesus insulted them by even saying anything like this. This is why the legalistic Jews felt so insulted. This is why the legalistic Jews felt so insulted. Because they did not believe Jesus was the Messiah. They certainly didn't believe that he was the one true God. Not their God. They didn't know who he was, a magician or a prophet. And yet he clearly said that to their face. Jesus Christ incorporated it in his teaching. He put it right in their face. So even before the apostles in their writing talked about Jesus Christ being part of a trinity, even though you don't see the word trinity in scripture, you, you don't see the word rapture either in scripture, unless you understand some of the original language and the, the hints and pointing to it, then you see it. But Jesus Christ used it in his teaching, put it right in their face. This is clearly what upset them. Now, from Exodus 3.14, we know that J-H-W-H was derived from that verb to be, actually, if you understand the Hebrew. God said to Moses, I am, Yahwa, who I am, Yahwa. This is why you are to say to the Israelites, I am, Yahwa has sent me to you. This means to exist, this word. To be, to have life or breath in your body, complete and established, it also means as well. It has a... a, a a bunch of meanings, but always means complete to always be, always have been, I am in the presence, I will be in the future. Take it from its root word, hava, in the Hebrew. Take a note on that. That's where it comes from. So if you understand some of the original language, you see where the word comes from and how it's used. On a number of occasions, Jesus refers to himself by using I am. On a number of occasions, he does this, and therefore that is what got them upset. And later on, the apostles would claim, Jesus Christ is God. Now, he said it himself. I'm going to show you ten of the ten I Ams, the famous ones out of the book of John. Many of you know uh, the ten I Ams. It's very popular, and it's an easy teaching to study. Why do you think he said these things? John 6.35, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am 6.41, the bread that came down out of heaven. What more does he need? Who is going to feed you? God takes care of all your logistical grace. He's saying, I am God. I came down to take care of you. I am. John 5, uh, 6, 51. I am the living bread. There it is again. Who supplies that? God does. He's saying, I am God. And using the I am terminology as well. Why do you think they became so upset with him? Also in John chapter 8, which you guys, I think, are still in John chapter 8. If not, you can go there. I'm going to put a lot of this on the board and you can come back on this message, obviously. Hit stop and take some notes if you need to. John 8, 12. I am, again, the light of the world. How can someone light up the whole world that has to be deity, God? John 8, 18. I am he who bears witness of myself because nobody else can bear witness for God but God. God is the divine light. And Lord and Savior Jesus Christ says, I am the light of the whole world, being God. I bear witness for myself because I am God and only God can bear witness to himself. These statements are clear teaching on the deity of Christ. 
So don't be fooled and don't let some other denomination or powerful uh, ministry out there that's knocking on your door tell you something different, folks. John 10, 7, what does it say? I am the door of the sheep. I am the good shepherd. You are my sheep. Reference to God's people. Him being God. John eleven twenty five. I am the resurrection and the life. You cannot get life without having God relationship with God. I am God. Again, the great I am. John eleven twenty five. John fourteen six. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus Christ putting it right in the legalistic Jewish uh, uh, scholars, right in their face. The scribes, Pharisees, and Sadducees. I am who I say I am. I am the great I am. The same one Moses and Abraham dealt with. That is me. I am the true vine. John fifteen one. Many of you know these scriptures, and it's good to jot them back down or go over them and realize what was Jesus saying. I am God. Those are the ten I am's of the Gospel of John, and of course, ten represents the number of completion, biblical completion. So again, something spiritual you can take from that. When the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was faced with the angry mob and he stood the injustice of phony trials that they put him through, he stood boldly and claimed that he is God during those unjust trials. And a lot of these trials uh, that go on today are, are filled with lies and injustice. But Jesus Christ had the worst in history set of trials in the middle of the night and being slapped around and beaten and spit upon. Think about that the next time you can't forgive somebody as we talked about last lesson. The injustice in those trials. Mark 14, 6, 61, what does that say? But he kept silent until he needed to speak. He knew when it was time to speak because his spiritual maturity was there. God, the Holy Spirit, led him through his whole human uh, existence while he was here on earth and made no answers. Again, the high priest was questioning him. He's beat up and exhausted and saying to him, Are you Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Because he's been saying it, so they wanted to hear him say it again, just so they could scream out and have a reason to crucify and murder him. The Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, did not shy away from the question when it was presented to him. He didn't shy away from it, but he did not go around telling everyone at every street corner, Hey, listen, I'm God. Listen to me, I'm God. That's not how he did it. He did it in his teachings, certain questions that were thrown at him to shut them down. He would say certain things, but he pronounced he was God in many, many different realms. It wasn't that he ran on every street corner, grabbed you by the shirt and said, you have to pay attention, I'm God. They needed faith to acknowledge who he, what he was and what that cross was all about. Mark 14, 62 goes on to say, and Jesus said, I am. Very definitive statement. They knew exactly those Jews that knew their, their Torah, knew exactly what he was saying. And you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power. He's talking about the throne of God in heaven. And coming with the clouds of heaven. Who can do that except God? That was Jesus' answer to the false trials and the lies they were throwing at him. In Isaiah 45, 22, God says of himself using the prophet, speaking through the prophet in Isaiah 45, 22, Turn to me and be saved. All the ends of the earth, for I am God, I am God, and there is no other. Verse 23, I've sworn by myself because I can't swear to anybody else. Jesus talking the same way. I have to swear by myself because there's nobody more pure or righteous than I am. The word has gone forth from my mouth in righteousness and will not turn back. That to me, every knee will bow, every tongue will swear allegiance to me and say who I am. Where do we get that from? The teachings of Paul. Think about it. Philippians 2.10, the teachings of Paul. Same scripture, same thing written hundreds and hundreds of years prior to the birth of Jesus Christ. Philippians 2.10, Paul says, At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Same thing. Jesus is God. He claimed it. He wove it right into his teachings. He proclaimed it in his teachings. He made sure the apostles understood how to put it in Scripture to complete the canon of Scripture, letting them, letting people know about the Trinity, divine, the divine triune Godhead, the Trinity, and him being the Son of God, and him being the doctrine of the hypostatic union wrapped up in that, 100% man, 100% God, done for us, for the joy set before him, us. He went to the cross and endured the pain and the shame. God became man. There are plenty of examples of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ teaching he is God and the apostles pointing to his deity regularly in their scripture. Paul, Colossians 
In Christ, all the fullness of deity lives in the bodily form, in Jesus Christ. Deity, God. Supreme deity. Titus 2.13, what does it say? Look for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God. Who's our great God? He's our God and our Savior. King of kings, Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. Christ Jesus. Ultimately, Jesus Christ can snap his fingers and stop the world from rotating and the sun from shining as good God the Father and God the Holy Spirit can do the same. The Trinity is one God, folks. One God with three distinct beings that the average person struggles to wrap their finite minds around. We all do. It's hard to understand one being and one God and three separate beings. I often use the term beings. I know people say, well, three persons because they are singular beings. But Jesus Christ is the humanity of the Godhead. Out of the triune God, we have Jesus Christ as the unique one of the universe, we always say. The unique one of the universe, the unique out of the triune Godhead, 100% God, and yet 100% man. How unique is that? No one, no one else, not even God the Father or God the Holy Spirit can lay claim to that uniqueness of 100% God, 100% man. Think about that. And, 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 and it, it, this type of uh, lesson that you got today should give you more ammunition pointing to Jesus Christ is God. And what he showed them during that storm on walking on the water, walking to Peter and calling him out and stepping on the boat and everything stops. If there was any doubt at that point in time that Jesus Christ is God, it should have came to a screeching halt at that point. Except for one, Judas Iscariot, which just goes to show people can say, well, yeah, if I see something, then I'll believe in Jesus Christ as God. And I'll believe in Jesus Christ as my Savior. You had people that walked and talked with Jesus Christ that did not believe Judas Iscariot, the biggest example. But there were many others, too. The, the legalistic Jews, Pharisees, scribes, and Sadducees, high intellect, high IQ, would not accept him other than a prophet or a magician. That's it. So don't think and don't believe the lie when somebody tells you, yeah, when God shows me something, comes down and walks next to me, I believe. They won't. If they won't believe in what the scriptures are and all the facts I've given you for well, this ministry or any ministry that's on point gives you, then they wouldn't believe. It's sad but true. Don't give up on evangelizing. I'm just letting you know. Don't be shocked and surprised when people do not believe in Jesus Christ and you laid it all out to them. I've given you ammunition today. Don't be shocked and surprised. Titus 2.13, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. How much clearer can it be than that? And yet many won't believe. We'll pray for everybody. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Father, we thank you for this time. Bless those that take these messages out to a lost and dying world, Father. And let these messages get out to the right set of ears, Father. We know God, the Holy Spirit's at work. And let them come to believe. And even if they struggle to believe, Father, let the seed be planted. And let us not stop planting the seeds, Father, until you rapture us and we see Christ in the clouds of the air and we're brought home, Father. We're asking all these things through your Son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.